Welcome to our webinar titled Decoding the Proposed CMMC Rule, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Rule and its Compliance. Um, very quickly, uh, just a little housekeeping before we start. We will be um, holding all the questions. If you do have questions as we're going through our presentations, please enter them into our uh, question and answer. Um, box and uh, we will make some time at the end. Hopefully we'll have some uh, quite a few minutes to um, answer your questions. All right. So we have lots of information to share with you today regarding the published CMMC rule. We will start with um, talking about the threat landscape and why the DUD makes implementation of the cybersecurity within their supply tiers a priority. We will review the current DFARS regulations, the CMMC program and its purpose. We will discuss what's in the new um, CMMC proposed rule, the, the rollout timelines, um, as well as the impact of this, that this will have on the um, DOD subcontractors. We will also have a guest presentation by CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency representative, who will review the wealth of CISA services and programs available to all of the companies. We will also provide information and additional resources available funds and upcoming implementation training that you may take advantage of. So before we start, let um, or I need to uh, let you know that nothing in this presentation, written, spoken, expressed, or implied, is a legal advice or should be construed as endorsement of any solution, product, service, or methodology. Also, we will be providing you with a general information on the requirements, but please um, always refer to the authoritative documents and regulations, which we will um, be listing a lot of, them, all of those on our slides, and use those as, as your guidelines as you move forward. Um, so let's a few words about CANSTEP. CANSTEP is the Connecticut MEP Center, the Manufacturer Extension Partnership. We are a part of a national web network that is sponsored and facilitated by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which means that there is one center just like CANSTEP in each of the states throughout the United States. And a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Anna Mumford, and I am the cybersecurity consultant at CANSTEP. Uh, I've, for the past five years, I've been working with small and medium manufacturers right here in Connecticut, assisting them with the regulatory um, cybersecurity compliance assessments and guiding their implementation of those assessments. We usually, when we engage with clients, we work with the company leadership as well as their IT resources, whether they are internal or external, to guide the company's cybersecurity compliance um, initiatives. Uh, I'm also a certified uh, CMMC registered registered practitioner. And um, fun fact about me, just last November, I graduated with my master's degree in cybersecurity management from Purdue University. Um, now I'm gonna pass this presentation to Dennis uh, from CISA. He will introduce CISA and talk about the uh, threat landscape. Dennis, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope you can see uh, my presentation here. Uh, my name is Dennis Mott. I ser currently serve as a CISA, that's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Protective Security Advisor here in Connecticut. Um, just a little background on myself. I have been with Homeland Security for over 14 years now. Uh, I have uh, recently knew within the last six months to serving in Connecticut, um, but I am s serving as a CISA Protective Security Advisor here in Connecticut. Prior to coming here, I served as the CISA Protective Security Advisor in Boston, Massachusetts for the city and the surrounding UASI cities and towns. Uh, prior to that, I served as a Protective Security Advisor for the state of Georgia, uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. 
And prior to that, <clears throat> I served as a regional operations within uh, CISA's regional operations group, uh, supporting the regional directors and our mission. Uh, also, uh, six years, seven years at uh, Homeland Security and CISA headquarters uh, down in Arlington, Virginia. Um, so a little bit on, on my background. I will share uh, up front that I am a certified information system security professional. Um, I'm also, um, I, I consider myself a cyber professional, physical security professional, protection professional, national security professional. And uh, of course, I, I do have some uh, other um, experiences as well. Prior to coming to Homeland Security, I had a full law enforcement career in New Jersey, retired as a chief of police after 23 years. Prior to that, uh, I served in the United States Air Force physical security, working, supporting, um, protecting resources for the Air Force here in the United States and overseas. A um, little bit about CISA itself. You see uh, my slide here. Uh, let me go ahead and... Um, all right. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about CISA's mission and, and CISA itself. And let me, let me share right up front before I get to the mission. Uh, so 14 years with Homeland Security. When I, I was first hired, I was hired into um, Homeland Security headquarters, as was our cybersecurity advisors. Uh, beginning in 2015, Homeland Security leadership began trying to pull out uh, DHS's cybersecurity communications and the infrastructure protection, security, and resilience, and create them as an operational agency. Uh, in 2018, Congress, the Senate, the President all signed the bill that created CISA. We are the 18th operational entity within Homeland Security, just like Secret Service, FEMA, ICE, um, any of the other TSA, any other uh, Homeland Security organizations, uh, we have CISA. And as America's Cyber Defense Agency and the National Coordinator for Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience, CISA leads the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to the cyber and physical infrastructure that Americans rely on every day. Uh, just one slide, uh, it's depicting a few different uh, areas within our mission set. What many people don't know is that CISA has the responsibility to protect 97 uh, federal government IT networks here in the United States. Um, also, as the Cyber Defense Agency, we serve as the conduit for all of uh, CISA's cyber resources that are available to private sector, government, uh, critical infrastructure, mass gathering partners. Um, infrastructure resilience and field operations as a protective security advisor with a focus on physical security, uh, that is where I reside. Uh, and CISA also within CISA is the Office for Emergency Communications. What many people don't know is that the Office of Emergency Communications works every day to protect and enhance the security and resilience of the Emergency Communications Center here in the United States. Two areas that are not on this slide, the National Risk Management Center. Uh, that is our analysis center within CISA. They are constantly analyzing the most important critical infrastructure issues facing the country, uh, specifically over the last four or five years, very actively involved in securing the supply chain. And then the last area here that is not up here is Homeland Security's Office for Bombing Prevention. OBP, as we call them, they rest within Homeland Security, um, and, uh, and they are part of CISA. So I just want to, I'm going to stop here in a minute, but before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the threat environment from, from my perspective and information that I share with our partners. Um, and I will say that on the in threat environment side, uh, the nation has been in a heightened threat environment for the last uh, two years. Um, the, um, the Secretary of Homeland Security used to issue a National Terrorism Advisory System Bulletin that was issued every six months. Um, that has been replaced with another annual um, um, uh, document. Uh, both of those state we remain in a heightened threat environment uh, on the physical side 
and I'll talk about the cyber side here in, in just a second. Uh, but on the physical security side and the threat environment, a little bit changed. Uh, going back to last year, we were in a heightened threat environment due to the threat, the terrorist threat uh, posed by domestic violence extremists, homegrown violent extremists. And then beginning uh, with, you know, once um, on October 7th, when Hamas attacked Israel, that changed things on the cyber side. Um, ever since November, foreign terrorist media organizations have been online um, calling for their followers to conduct attacks against the United States and in the United States. Um, so I wanted to share that on the physical security side. Moving over to the uh, cyber security side. We've been working um, for many, many years to protect IT networks throughout the country. Um, and understanding uh, the threats is important for us to go ahead and be able to do that. Um, we've always been concerned about uh, hackers, criminal groups, uh, foreign adversaries attempting to compromise IT networks in the country, uh, IT infrastructure. Um, the current environment, I want to go ahead and share some information, some important information that was released on January 31st. On January 31st, there was a hearing before the House of Representatives in Washington. Um, CISA Director Jen Easterly, uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation Director Christopher Wray, uh, National Security Agency uh, Director and the head of U.S. Army Cyber Command, General Nakasone, and also the United States uh, Cyber Director, Harry Coker, were all present and gave testimony to Congress on the current threats posed by the People's Republic of China. Um, uh, once that information was shared on January 31st, there was a following joint cybersecurity advisory that was issued for widest dissemination to all of our partners, everyone involved in the country with uh, cybersecurity and IT security and resilience. Uh, there have been a few updates to that, and we most recently issued a fact sheet on the People's Republic of China state-sponsored cyber activity, is specifically titled Actions for Critical Infrastructure Leaders. Uh, the fact sheet provides an overview for executive leaders on the urgent risk posed by the People's Republic of China, state-sponsored cyber actors known as Volt Typhoon. CISA, along with the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and other U.S. government and international partners released the major cybersecurity advisory on February 7th, in which all agencies warned cybersecurity defenders that Vault Typhoon has been pre-positioning themselves on U.S. critical infrastructure organizations, IT networks, to enable disruption or destruction of critical services in the event of increased geopolitical tensions and or military conflict with the United States and its allies. This is a critical business risk for every organization in the United States and allied countries. The advisory provides detailed information related to Volt Typhoon's activity and describes how the group has successfully compromised U.S. organizations, especially in the energy, communications, transportation systems, and water and wastewater system sectors. The authoring agencies urge critical infrastructure owners and operators to review the advisory for defensive actions for defensive actions against the threat and potential impacts to national security. CISA and our partners are releasing the fact sheet, this one here for critical infrastructure leaders. Uh, we are releasing this uh, with guidance to help them prioritize the protection of critical infrastructure and functions. All of the authoring agencies urge leaders to recognize cyber risk as a core business risk this recognition is necessary for both good governments and is fundamental to national security. So that's the current environment that we're in that I'm going to share today and I'm going to hand it back over to Anna. Thank you, Dennis. Let me share back my presentation. Perfect. Perfect. That was a very, um, 
interesting and sobering information um, just to support that uh, in 2022, the manufacturing sector became the number one target for cyber attacks, accounting for nearly 25% of all cyber attacks um, across all industries. So that's definitely um, a very sobering um, fact. Um, according to the Bureau of Industry and Security, 99% of all manufacturers in the US are small and medium-sized manufacturers, yet about 50% of those lack basic security controls. That means that the national security of our country is at risk. Let's talk about the US defense industrial base, the, the deep sector. Um, there is an estimated total of about 300,000 thousand subcontractors nationwide supporting the U.S. military. The DOD estimate as of late 2021 was that about 27% of the 300,000 handles CUI, the control and classified information. That is about 80,000 of companies, which means that 99% of all DOD designs, makes, and uses come from small and medium-sized manufacturers. And, yes, and yet the majority of those are wildly unprotected and lack basic security safeguards. So the, the U.S. manufacturers are bleeding critical information, which diminishes the U.S. military capabilities and the ability for our country to defend itself. Um, our government and the DOD are very, uh, very well aware of this risk. And in response, they have developed a series of cybersecurity regulations to protect the control and classified uh, information in all tiers of their supply chain. So the first um, regulation that they implemented was the DFARS clause, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, the um, 252-204-7012, which we just simply call the DFARS 7012 which applies to anyone that works under the DOD contract, whether it is a prime subcontractor, a subcontractor, um, I'm sorry, the, the prime contractor, subcontractor, or all the way down to the lowest uh, tier. And the objective of that was to safeguard controlled and classified information that may reside in the contractor's internal information systems, report security um, incidents to the DOD, and flow those requirements their own subcontractors. And to comply with these requirements, the DOD adopted the NIST Special Publication 8171 framework, which consists of the 110 controls. There was a wide non-compliance with these regulations, and in which resulted with uh, issuing additional interim rules. And the first two was the DFAS 7019 and DFAS 7020. The 19 spoke about um, that there contractors were required to perform self-assessment against the NIST 8171 framework and enter the result of that assessment, the score, into the SPRS database, the Supplier Performance Risk System. The DFAS 7020 spoke about the DOD performing audits of the scores that the company entered into the SPRS database. And, and yes, they have been auditing those contractors' compliance and finding um, a lot of overinflated scores and misrepresentations. So in June of 2019, the CMC program was announced. The objective of the program was to provide the DOD with a compliance verification mechanism. They were moving away from the self-attestation security model. And as you can see, the CMMC program was created over many years and, and stages. And um, the, so the CMMC version 2.0 uh, was released in February of 2020, and that um, version adapted the three CMMC levels. Um, and since 2022, the program has been going through a rigorous process of being vetted on a government site. And finally, just last December, actually December 26th of 2023, um, it was published. And now we know precisely what is in it. So let me just say, before we get into it, let me just say that the CMC took some time to create. It was... Um, uh, um, you know, it, it, it actually has a great level of sophistication and maturity. It is a complete, robust and well-written policy that will improve the clarity and consistency regarding the requirements. And it actually provides um, the necessary detail to implement um, the CMMC rule across the ecosystem. Oops, there we go. 
Um, CMMC anticipated effective date is uh, first quarter of 2025 at this point. And to ensure that we are all on the same page, let me just quickly go through the three levels and the requirements, um, just as a perhaps uh, um, you know a refresher for a lot of our um, participants. So it is a third, uh, three-tiered model uh, with three progressively sophisticated uh, and advanced levels, depending on the type of uh, information, the priority of the of the information that the supplier would handle. Level one is a foundational. Uh, level, it applies to any organization handling FCI, the federal contract information. And it uh, those in, uh, organizations are required to implement 15 requirements to safeguard FCI. Level two is advanced, applies to any contractor that receives CUI by or on behalf of the DOD or collects, develops, transmits, or stores the CUI in support of the performance of the OD contract. Now, the, the, the contractors are required to, pro, to protect the CUI uh, through implementation of the um, DFAR 7012 regulations and, and the security requirements. As, as you recall, um, they adapted the NIST 8171 framework, so you are required to be compliant with that as well. Now, level three of the CMMC, it's an expert level, uh, and it is for the highest priority of CUI. It is estimated to apply only to about 1% of the contractors, uh, mostly just prime contractors, and it will encompass the 110 practices from NIST 8171 plus additional 24 practices from NIST 8172. So quickly, um, let's talk about FCI, CUI, and how can a company discover whether they have, um, you know, any of this type of inc information and what what information they do handle. So FCI is information relative relative to the performance of a government contract where there is an expectation of confidentiality of any information that is not lawfully available uh, for release to the public. Now, when it comes to CUI, there's really no simple definition. CUI is the government's wide initiative across all the government branches and departments to identify information that requires safeguarding. So um, that includes wide range of, inf of information in the DOD sector, such as the covered defense information, which is unclassified information that is provided to the contractor by or on behalf of DOD in connection with the performance of the contract, or it is collected, developed, received, transmitted, used, or stored by or, or on behalf of the um, contractor in support of the contract. It is also information that falls in one of the following categories. It is um, control technical information, critical information, export control information, or any other information marked or otherwise identified in the contract that requires safeguarding. Uh, for many of our clients, that also might be an ITAR information. Uh, please note that um, a subcontractor may receive as well as develop or collect the CUI. So the rule of thumb in here is that if the information meets the definitions within CUI registry, it is considered CUI, whether it is marked or it's not marked. And uh, contr so contractors need to actually identify or determine what type of information your company receives or develops that qualifies as CUI. And to do that, you can refer to the National Archives uh, website, which um, Lawrence should be entering in the chat right now, a link to that, um, and, and become familiar with the various CUI categories that are in there. Um, I, I personally like um, the dodcui.mil website. Uh, they have a list of the CUI categories, and, and under each of the category, you can um, have, you have the description, you have examples, you also have a guidelines and marking of the CUI. Uh, really great resource and highly um recommend going and actually um, reviewing those. All right. So as I mentioned, the CMC has an assessment requirement. And there are two types of assessment for level one and two. Um, so there is an annual self-assessment with the resulting score entered into the SPRS score, uh, SPRS database. And um, then you have the official of the company needs to affirm that scored, um, the assessment score is accurate. 
The second one is a certification that verifies the effective uh, and complete implementation of the prescribed security controls. And those certification would be performed by C3PAO, accredited CMMC third party assessment organizations that will be authorized to perform those assessments. An assessor will use an assessment methodologies outlined in the NIST uh, A hundred one seventy one eight assessor's guide, and the CMMC assessment methodologies um, under the DFAR seventy nineteen twenty and twenty one to um, examine, interview, and test if the secure controls are implemented correctly, operating as intended, and producing the desired outcomes. Basically, so when it comes to information systems and the organizations, it it. Uh, covers more than just the technical practices. You have uh, operational and managerial uh, practices, and there's just so much more to that as well. So just keep in mind. Um, so once the CMMC is in effect, um, the DOD program manager will select the CMMC level for a particular procurement based on the type of information that will be processed, stored, or transmitted by the contractor. So the DOD contractors will need to achieve that particular CMMC level as a condition of the contract award. So it's important to understand the requirements and what, what's in each of the level so you don't miss out on those opportunities to bid. Uh, so let's go through um, the levels. Level one, um, it's um, required all 15 controls will need to be implemented fully. There is no score. You are either um, compliant, not compliant, you either met or not met the compliance. Uh, and that requires only self-assessment that will be required to uh, enter the results entered uh, into SPRS uh, database. Level two must have a minimum of 80% compliance with the 110 controls to receive a conditional compliance status which then must be confirmed by a POEM closeout assessment within 180 days. So if you get a conditional compliance status during your assessment, you will then need to close out any open items on your POEM, your plan of action milestone with that C3PAO assessors within 180 days to receive the certification, the full certification. And then level three, first, um, those, those um, contractors first will need to um, receive the or gain the level two certification and then receive minimum of 80% compliance during an assessment by the DOD or the government uh, and the additional 24 practices from this 172 um, where each of the practice 24 practices will have a one point values only and again um, there will be um, 180 days to uh, remedy any uh, outstanding open items. So let's let's talk about uh, very, just very briefly about poem, the plan of action of milestones, and what closing out uh, of poem open items really means. Uh, so think of poem as a to do list, and open item um, um, are the controls on your poems that are still still need to be compliant. They are not compliant at this point. Okay, so. To qualify for conditional certification, only uh, controls that have a one point value or they are the low criticality controls are allowed to be left on a poem or being non-compliant. Okay? Medium and high criticality requirements with a point value of three or five respectively are restricted from poem or they cannot be left open or non-compliant on poem. They all have to be compliant. So if a poem is not closed out within the 180 days time frame, uh, meaning that you do not have a, a full compliance with all of the 110 controls, then the conditional certification will just simply expire. Um, also, the CMMC rule now states that external service providers, the ESP, uh, which is might be the uh, your IT managed service provider, cloud service provider, or other vendors, um, if they process, store, or transmit CUI or other security protection data, such as system logs, configuration, or uh, monitoring data, um, those are now subject to compliance, which means that the ESP's uh, technology, their, their people, their facilities may be subject to compliance um, with their requirements. Okay, So um, 
um, so, so, so um, those organizations may need to have an ap appropriate CMMC level certification or be a FedRAMP certified. So the implant, oops, sorry, I skip one. There we go. So the implementation of CMMC will be done in a phased approach. There will be four phases. The phase one will start at the effective date, which at this point is quarter one uh, of 2025. And at that time, the DOD solicitations will start including the self-assessment for level one and two, although some of the solicitations may start asking for the CMMC level two certifications. Phase two will begin six months after that, uh, at this point, uh, level two will require certifications, although some of those um, certification may uh, specify um, that this certification is due at another option period, right? So it might be delayed or something, you know, specified in those something in those terms. Also, solicitations with level three requirements will start to appear. Phase three will start 12 months later or 18 months uh, after the effective date. And solic solicitations will require certifications and full compliance for all three of the levels. Although some solicitations with level three requirements may still have the due at option period um, in there. Uh, and finally, phase four starting 12 months later or 30 months since the effective date will include um, CMC uh, requirement in all solicitations for all of the levels. Right. And um, so I want to just take a moment to talk about um, other things to consider that are often missed by companies but are just critical part of compliance. Okay, so uh, a contractor needs to identify or, or discover the CUI and FCI that I just mentioned before, right? Um, and kind of understand what what type of or categories of CUI they may they may uh, reside under systems, uh, whether it is received or developed. So um, a map of CUI flow through the organization is um, you know very important to have something like to understand where it is, um, and that this information as you go with it through that exercise it will fall into creation will be based. Uh, for creation of scoping documents. Um, the CUI discovery process needs to identify where the CUI can flow and where it cannot flow, um, you know, how it is marked, whether it's marked properly, the CUI sources or destinations. Also, the flow down of the requirements to the subcontractors uh, was already in place under the DFAR 7012. So if you share CUI with your suppliers, you must ensure and validate that those suppliers meet compliance at the appropriate level. Again, it is in the DFAR 7012. Also, an organization needs to develop internal processes for ongoing risk assessment, risk management, and governance, uh, including the uh, external service providers. You also need to have an incident response capability internally. You have a, in, to have an internal uh, incident response team and train the team on how to handle any secure incidents. You also need to support your assessment score with adequate evidence and documentation, providing that uh, you have implemented, actually proving that you have implemented the security um, requirements correctly. They are operating as intended and you have the adequate and sufficient evidence to prove that the secure controls are producing the desired outcomes along with the prescribed policies and procedures and other required documentation. All this documentation needs to be sustained, updated and continuously maintained and affirmed at least um, annually. Of course, a, a lot of them will be um, at much you know, more closer frequencies. So now I am going to pass the presentation to Dennis. Let me stop sharing. Dennis. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you. And can everyone see, can you see the screen there? Um, so a uh, pleasure to be back with you and, and to go ahead and share this uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation is focused on cybersecurity. I will also have some um, physical security uh, resources that are available to our partners at the end. 
Uh, and uh, this was developed by uh, cybersecurity advisor Dave Palmbach and myself. And um, let's see here, that didn't move. There we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the advisors here in the state that are available to assist entities within Connecticut uh, identify and mitigate risk. So CISA has, uh, has assigned two prote protective security advisors and two cybersecurity advisors here in Connecticut to assist our partners uh, in gaining access to CISA resources, uh, information sharing, and ultimately to help them go ahead and identify and mitigate risk. The two cybersecurity advisors are David Pombach and Abad Kabasa. Uh, they both work with all of our partners uh, with, uh, to, uh, to put them in contact with cyber assessment services and resources. The two physical security um, protective security advisors are PSA Mike Kowal and myself, Dennis Ma. We work with all of our partners on the physical security side. Uh, we're specifically focused on uh, working uh, to enhance uh, security and resilience for critical critical infrastructures and mass gatherings, and also to protect facilities. So I want to move into the cybersecurity services, and hopefully I'm going to, to get this all in for everyone. So I've got a listing here. There's uh, six cybersecurity assessments that are available to all of our partners. These assessments are conducted by uh, CISA cybersecurity advisors, uh, Pombach and Kabasa. Uh, the first one uh, right up top there is cyber performance goals, uh, excuse me, the cybersecurity performance goals. Uh, they are a subset of cybersecurity practices uh, selected through a process of industry, government, and expert consultation. Um, the CPGs, cyber performance goals, strive to help small and medium-sized businesses and organizations uh, start their cybersecurity efforts by by prioritizing investments in a limited number of essential actions that will enhance security outcomes. Uh, the, uh, the CPGs, it's a high level uh, security assessment. I think there are only 34 questions within it. Um, and it's really focused on the best practices. CISA wants all of our uh, critical infrastructure, uh, cybersecurity partners to be uh, working on. Um, the, uh, the cyber performance goals, it is, they are uh, mapped to the NIST cybersecurity framework. And the ultimate product that comes out of this assessment is a report to our stakeholders, um, including any identified vulnerabilities along with options to consider to mitigate them. And let me say this right up front regarding all of these assessments and our services. Everything that CISA is doing, both on the cybersecurity side, physical security side, is to help our partners identify vulnerabilities. When we talk about working to mitigate risk, uh, one of the, uh, the hardest things for organizations to do is to go ahead and identify vulnerabilities. All of our resources and assessments are designed to go ahead and do that, help and assist our partners in uh, identifying and mitigating risk. Uh, moving off of the cyber performance goals, we I'm going to move down to the third one, the cyber resilience review. Uh, this uh, assessment is looking at the overall maturity of the organization, the IT um, um, a network, and, and its ability to function in both steady state and during times of stress. It's a very in-depth uh, cybersecurity assessment. Uh, there's approximately 300 questions on the Cyber Resilience Review, and it's addressing 10 domains of uh, cybersecurity, uh, looking at specifically uh, controls management, vulnerability uh, management, incident management, um, 10 total areas here under the Cyber Resilience Review. The assessment itself generates a report along with vulnerabilities and options for consideration. The cyber resilience assessments. This is a really, um, it's not as in-depth as the cyber resilience review. It's only 120 questions. Uh, and again, it's looking at the maturity of the organization's IT network and associated practices. 
Moving down to the external dependencies management. This assessment is looking at an organization's, uh, it's actually assessing the activities and practices that are used by an organization uh, to manage its risk arising from external dependencies. Uh, the fifth one is the cyber infrastructure survey. This assessment is really looking at the security controls that are deployed on the network. And it's looking to identify any vulnerabilities in, uh, in how they are configured. Um, the uh, cyber infrastructure survey comes with a final report along with uh, identified vulnerabilities and options to consider to mitigate them. And then you see the last one, the incident management review. This assessment is focused on uh, incident response. Uh, the questions um, gather information on incident response and generate a final report for our stakeholders. I will say incident response is very important for all, all, all organizations. All organizations should have a cybersecurity uh, incident response plan. If there is anyone looking for some specific resources, uh, CISA developed, uh, developed our incident and vulnerability response playbooks back about a year and a half ago. Uh, they were required uh, by the president going back uh, two and a half years ago. Those, uh, the, um, the incident response and the vulnerability playbooks were designed for all federal government agencies, but we encourage all of our private sector, critical infrastructure, small and medium-sized businesses to go ahead and take a look at those playbooks. There's a wealth of information there that can help any organization develop incident response plans. All right. Um, I want to mention cyber hygiene scanning. This is actually a service that uh, CISA offers to all of our partners. Um, it continually assesses uh, internet accessible systems for known vulnerabilities and provides actionable reports to partners. Really, it's scanning the endpoints of our IT network where they meet the internet, looking to identify vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, and provide that information in a report uh, along with uh, options to consider to mitigate those vulnerabilities uh, to help our partners uh, reduce risk. This, is a, uh, this uh, service is very easy to sign up for. Um, you see uh, there is an email here. Uh, vulnerability at cisa.dhs.gov. Lauren, I think I gave that to you. You can put that in the, uh, the chat for everyone. We are encouraging all of our critical infrastructure, government, private sector owners and operators to go ahead and sign up for this service. The scans are reoccurring. They Right now, they can occur every week, every two weeks, or every month. And um, again, uh, a report comes to you with the identified vulnerabilities and the options to consider to mitigate them in an effort to help our partners identify the vulnerabilities on their IT networks. Um, planning, um, you can request the service through this email here, um, and uh, you will be asked to provide a list of external facing IP addresses. You provide that and then confirm the uh, scanning schedule that you want. Uh, you will receive a pre-scan notification and the scanning will begin uh, just a few weeks later. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really that detailed report to help our partners uh, mitigate risk. I've heard from chief information security officers about how valuable this information is. Uh, they were not aware of the vulnerabilities that, that the scanning uh, was able to go ahead and identify. And let me move over to uh, uh, information sharing uh, with all of our partners. Now you're seeing here on this slide a few examples of the information that we have been sharing with our partners. Um, CISA looks to share information on all cybersecurity, um, uh, how shall I say it, vulnerabilities, uh, 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 threats, mitigations uh, to go ahead and assist our partners in protecting the IT networks. Here are some examples, um, you know, an advisory issued and a fact sheet on implementing phishing resistant MFA, multi-factor authentication, and how to do that. Um, you see the joint cybersecurity advisory that was issued by the National Security Agency and CISA regarding their, uh, the red and blue teams sharing their top 10 security, cybersecurity misconfigurations, uh, protecting against malicious use of remote monitoring and management uh, software. 
uh, and then the uh, the final one, the joint guidance. This is directly related to China. Uh, uh, one of the ways that Boat Typhoon has been going ahead and compromising IT networks here in the United States is by living off the land, basically using vulnerabilities in our existing systems to gain access, uh, compromise our networks, um, disappear, hide in the networks. And anyone can sign up to receive this information. Uh, Lauren, here is the second link to please include in the chat. You see it down below, the www.cisa.gov, contact us, subscribe. If you go ahead and go to that website, uh, you will have the option to go ahead and sign up and receive uh, all of our cybersecurity advisories and, um, and important cybersecurity information that CISA releases to our public partners, both private sector, government, uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators. I will say to you, that if you just sign up, uh, there are a there's a large number of information that is shared. You will receive a, a, a good amount of emails. If you just want to receive our joint cybersecurity advisories, and you see three of them listed here on this page, just check off cybersecurity advisories only. And that is what you would receive if you want to receive the information. All right. Um, I want to move over to the uh, Secure Cloud business applications. So uh, this project provides product-specific security baselines for critical business applications. Um, it, it, you see here the examples of uh, Microsoft uh, 365 and Google Workspace, uh, but it's basically a assessment tool. And let me go to the next page. Um, I don't think this is our our best. Uh, example of how the process works, but the SCUBA baseline assessment tool runs in your own environment. And it's testing to see if cloud applications are secure. And if not, it provides measures to go ahead and align the products with security baselines. Uh, and it aligns with CISA's recommendations. We are encouraging all of our partners to take advantage of this tool. This is a relatively new tool, only about three or four months old, um, but it can really uh, assist all of our partners with the cloud applications and ensuring they align to the, uh, the security baselines. Um, Logging Made Easy is another tool um, just recently released available to all of our partners. So it's a centralized log management tool. And what it does is it identifies logs that are on the network, uh, computer logs, uh, firewall logs, uh, server logs, and uh, it goes ahead and brings them into one place. And the tool will analyze the logs uh, and provide information uh, on, on the analysis. And it also, um, it also goes ahead and identifies activities that are happening in the logs. Let's say as an example, um, someone logging into a server and they shouldn't be, they might not have access. Uh, they're attempting to log in. Uh, that, that would be, uh, you'd receive that notification. So um, again, uh, the, uh, the logging made easy, uh, the guide to go ahead and set this up, set the rules for your agency is available up on GitHub uh, GitHub for all of our partners. Um, next slide, malware next generation. You know, back some years ago, uh, organizations used to have to, if they wanted a file to be have malware analysis conducted on it, uh, they used to have to submit it to CISA. Uh, and then it, uh, CISA would uh, conduct the analysis and provide a report. Uh, today, uh, the malware next generation uh, tool is basically a private malware sandbox. And um, it analyzes files that are submitted and give, gives reports on whether or not the file contains malicious computer code and, and or is malicious uh, and what it would be trying to do on the network. Uh, this is a great tool for all of our partners if uh, regarding phishing and the attachments uh, that they might want to go ahead and, and share. Uh, relatively new, uh, the malware next generation tool. And then uh, over to CISA tabletop, the tabletop exercise package. So we encourage all of our uh, all of our partners, critical infrastructure owners and operators, 
uh, organizations, uh, information uh, uh, technology departments and leaders to go ahead and conduct tabletop exercises every year. Uh, the, the, uh, the CISA tabletop exercise package is designed to go ahead and assist our critical infrastructure owners and operators in developing their own tabletop exercises to meet the specific needs of the facilities and stakeholders. There's 15 cybersecurity scenarios that are there along with 71 physical security scenarios and uh, two convergence scenarios. Uh, so that is <clears throat> available. If you go to CISA's website, CISA.gov, and you type in uh, tabletop exercise package, uh, it will bring you to the link to access uh, the web page with those resources. I want to move over onto the physical security resources. Uh, and, um, you know, we work with all of our partners uh, to uh, protect cyber and, and physical security. Um, and on the physical security side, there are a number of assessments that protective security advisors conduct to go ahead and help our partners identify, uh, identify risk and provide options to consider to mitigate it. We have two key um, security assessments on the physical security side. Uh, and let me see if that works. All right, great. Uh, the safe assessment tool. Uh, security assessment at first entry. This tool is designed to, as to assess the current security posture of an organization and identify options for facility owners and operators to mitigate the relevant threats and implement protective measures. The tool is intended for facilities that have a less mature security posture, including ones such as um, houses of worship, health clinics. But we use it in government facilities and critical infrastructure facilities as well. Um, the, uh, the data collection is a little bit shorter with this one, uh, and all of our partners receive a report identifying the vulnerabilities and options to consider to mitigate them. And then the more in-depth uh, security survey on the physical security side is the infrastructure survey tool security survey. Uh, the infrastructure survey tool security survey is a web-based uh, vulnerability survey that applies weighted scores to identify infrastructure vulnerabilities and trends across sectors. It facilitates a consistent collection of security information. It's in depth. And <clears throat> you see here the physical security areas uh, where information is collected, physical security, security force, security management, information sharing, and the protective measures in place. You also see dependencies, the IST, is looking at the physical security of, uh, of a facility along with its resiliency. Uh, and all of the resiliency information is collected under dependencies. There are questions there under the dependencies about the facility's dependence on electric power, communications, water, wastewater, natural gas, critical products, communications, IT, information technology and the network. And all of that information is developed to get to uh, all the information is gathered to develop the final report uh, to our stakeholders, uh, I, highlighting the commendable activities that are underway, identified vulnerabilities and options for the stakeholder to identify to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's also dashboards that come with uh, this assessment. And you see here, here are the data categories uh, for the IST. It's more in depth in the data collection uh, then the safe assessment. And you see examples of the two interactive dashboards that come to partners who might want a IST security survey. Uh, they receive the full report along with interactive dashboards that they can uh, change information, save their own scenarios, and where they receive a comparison uh, to like facilities in the same sector who have been assessed. Um, so for the next steps for all organizations, uh, please schedule a cyber performance goal assessment, uh, very high level, uh, easy, 34 questions. Uh, you can also schedule a security at first entry, a safe assessment on the physical security side. Uh, and please sign up for CISA Sci-High Vulnerability Scanning. This service is a great service for any organization to continually check for new vulnerabilities. Um, you can also sign up for CISA's email distribution list and assess uh, also assess potential use cases for the free tools that I have discussed here. 
uh, whether it's the mal malware next generation or the logging made e easy or the scuba tool. So, and please, you know, conduct those tabletop exercises yearly in an effort uh, for you to go ahead and um, uh, assist you in your disaster and recovery planning. This is the point of contact information for all four of the CISA representatives here in Connecticut. You see across the top, the two cybersecurity advisory, uh, advisors, uh, David Palmbach, and you see his email address here. Our, our second cybersecurity advisor is Abad Kabasa. You see his point of contact information. And then the two protective security advisor. You see uh, my partner, Mike Kowal's information. And there you see me, Dennis Ma. Uh, our emails, our phone numbers, if there's any interest in taking advantage of any CISA's, any of CISA's resources, and these resources are, are uh, they're no cost. They're all available. They're as a result of our uh, tax dollars paying for cybersecurity uh, to protect the country and protect IT networks throughout the country. I encourage you to contact either the cybersecurity advisors for Connecticut, David and Abad, or contact the protective security advisors for Connecticut, Mike Kowal and myself. Uh, that is all that I have for the group today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. Let me just quickly share my screen. I have, uh, we're almost out of time, but I have uh, um, uh, just a little bit of more information for you. Uh, first of all, please um, Take note that a lot of those services will support those secure controls that you are required to implement under the um, uh, NIST 800 framework and CMMC. So um, again, just great resources. Thank you, Dennis. Um, very quickly, um, I have uh, three more slides, so let me do that quick before we uh, adjourn. Um, I would like you to think about or consider creating a plan moving forward. Uh, with the end date of January of 2025. What are the things that you need to do, whether it's to uh, find a compliant external ser service provider, uh, maybe, you know, doing, um, uh, making sure your program does not have any open items that are restricted. Uh, one thing I do want to um, point out is that as you get closer to the effective date for CMMC, think in terms of um, making sure that you have all of the, 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 the perfect score or everything completed, um, perhaps you would want to at this point uh, verify that all of your documentation, all of your evidence, everything is in place and well organized. Uh, before you uh, step up to go through the C3PA or certification event, uh, maybe do uh, get some an external um, uh, resources to come in and perform like internal pre-assessment compliance check. Um, and to make sure that you are well prepared for the assessment itself. And in here in the slide, you will see a, a whole bunch of resources. Uh, uh, Lauren is going to be entering some of that in the chat as well, um, some um, links to websites. But again, please refer to those um, as well. Now, two more things. First is that for those of you that need uh, assistance, CANSTEP will be hosting a CMMC bootcamp training, which will be a five half day sessions between August 28th and September 25th of this year. Um, the sessions will, yes, we will go through the CMC uh, requirements and the NIST framework controls and the various methods of implementation. We'll work on scoping documentation, mapping of CUI, uh, going through the methodologies and, and procedures of risk assessment, risk management within organization. We will do hands-on exercise to develop uh, customized policy and procedure system secure plan, incident response plan, which are all required documents we'll provide with a template and kind of work on customizing that. Um, the registration will start in May, but please let us know if you are interested. And if you do need immediate assistance, please reach out to us directly. Um, I'm going to have my contact information at the last slide, and uh, Lauren's going to enter our uh, landing page on canstep.org. Um, and if you, you know, if you have any questions, if you're unsure of something, please con contact us, reach out. We'll get you sorted out. We'll we'll work with um, Dennis and make sure that you get the right services or what else you may need at that point. Um, lastly, there is. I I apologize. This was the slide for our CMMC bootcamp. 
Um, and lastly, we have a state, a state funding available. Uh, it is the Siri and Cyber Assistance Program administered by CCAT. And um, you have down there also a website to that uh, information. There's lots of details under the website. Um, so please, uh, this is the time to really work, make sure that you don't miss on the DOD contract opportunities in coming up future. Um, last slide, uh, you have my contact information in here as well. Um, do the, are there any questions? I see one question. Uh, we are two minutes past, but let's go through very quickly through that. The question is from Max, if you have a managed service provider that houses your server containing CUI information and CUI location, and they're, they're SAC2 compliant, but not FedRAMP, um, can we still use them and be CMMC com, uh, compliant? Um, to the best of my knowledge, um, CMMC certification and or FedRAMPs are the only two at this point available. Um, I have not read or heard anywhere else that uh, SAC two might be compliant. However, um, you know it's it's you know case to case kind of thing. But um, you you know they may if, if they are SAC two compliant, becoming compliant with CMC or FedRAMP, it's just a little bit step up. Um, they almost probably almost there. So I would suggest that you know they think about maybe creating an enclave to become. Uh, compliant for that enclave and those uh, clients that have uh, CUI and they host the CUI. Um, that's an issue with a lot of, of this uh, ITMS piece at this point. And then just, I guess they just need to figure out how they're gonna support their clients that gonna be CMMC uh, compliant. Um, any other questions? There is one other question, Anna, that came in through chat. I'll read it to you. Um, should we mention those four opportunities in the original vulnerability and CYHY scan? I am not sure if I understand this question. I, I, uh, I think, Anna, I think okay. that might have to do with the, um, uh, I don't know if it's a crossover question between the cyber hygiene vulnerability scan, the sci high. Um, and um, you don't have to mention any specific vulnerabilities if that's what it applies to. You can just go to the, uh, the link uh, that's put in there in the chat to sign up. Um, and again, you're gonna get the information to go ahead and please provide the, uh, the IP addresses to be scanned. Um, and then um, you'll get a, a confirmation of that and a notification. Um, and then you'll start receiving the scans, the reports, and the vulnerabilities and options to consider. It's a great tool for all of our partners, very helpful to everyone in identifying vulnerabilities in an effort to help them mitigate risk to the IT networks. Great, Fantastic. free of charge as well. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. That was a question for you. Um, well, uh, if there are no other questions, I know we are five minutes past the hour. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending and for your attention. Again, if you have any questions, I know there is a long way ahead of us, but we're here to help and assist you any way we can. Thank you so much. Bye.